you are welcome to my channel thanks for visiting remembering to subscribe giving thumbs up leaving your comment sharing all my presentations and listening to this very one today it is all about funder parinos this will be under the brand name aristra it belongs to the class of medications known as anticoagulant, a factor 10A inhibitor and a synthetic pentosaccharide. Uses of fondaparinus in acute coronary syndrome, meaning ST elevated myocardial infarction, non ST elevated myocardial infarction, and unstable angina. In even thrombosis, in pulmonary embolism, many in venous you know, thromboembolism treatment and superficial vein thrombosis treatment in heparin induced thrombocytopenia and for venous thromboembolism prophylaxis. Dosage forms. Could be in form of solution for subcutaneous administration as from the parinol sodium. In that case could be generally 2.5 mg per 0.5 ml or 5 mg per 0.4 ml or 7.5 mg per 0.6 ml or 10 mg per 0.8 ml. Could be preservative free as aristras from the parinol sodium or generic at the similar dosage as above. Administration. Mostly given by subcutaneous route, you have to alternate the injection site, and we don't give this medication within six hours post orthopedic surgery. Abdominal wall is used. Here we can use right or left anterolateral or posterolateral wall. When you need to give this intravenously, it must be that you are dealing with ST elevated myocardial infarction. In that case will miss the initial dose with normal setting and give that over one to two minutes. Or you may give the initial dose, have a push, and then flush the tubing with normal setting. But there is no intramuscular administration here. Let me repeat no IM, no intramuscular administration here. Mechanism of action. From the parinol, this is synthetic pentosaccharide that causes an antithrombotic tree mediated selective inhibition of factor 10A. Neutralization of factor 10A will interrupt the blood coagulation cascade, thereby inhibiting thrombin formation. From the parinol, does not inhibit thrombin 2A. Monitoring. We should have complete blood count. With the definition of complete blood count, platelets should be included. Renal function test should be done. I will tell you why in a bit. We should have stool for occult blood test. Why that? There's likelihood of bleeding. We must have clotting profile before and why the patient is on the medication and even after. Liver function test should be done. Anti factor 10A activity should be assayed. Central nervous system examination because there may be confusion. And of course, general physical examination looking for bleeding and signs of bleeding like petechiae, purpura, echemosis, hematoma, and so on. Monitoring. In thromboprophylaxis, plasma concentration should be taken in three hours post administration. So, if it's used for prophylaxis, the value is expected to be 0.39 to 0.50 milligram per liter. But if onoparinose is being used for therapeutic purpose at therapeutic dosing, three hours post administration value. Suspected to be between 1.2 to 1.26 milligram per liter. Blood drug interaction. 
There are a lot of medications, even over-the-counter medications and apps that may interact with this particular medication. So I will leave the judgment to the pharmacist or clinical pharmacologist in your jurisdiction. You know why? In medicine, nobody knows it all. And even beyond that, I don't know the medications you might be on and you may not be on, either now or in future, before taking this medication or while on it. Contraindications. We will not use fondaparinos if there's history of hypersensitivity to fondaparinos or any component of its formulation. We will not use fondaparinos if there's renal impairment and kidney clearance is less than 30 mL per minute. No fondaparinos. Anyone with active bleeding, no fondaparinos. We will not use this in effective endocarditis and not in thrombocytopenia that is associated with in vitro tests for antiplatelets and antibodies. One, we should be very careful when we're using this medication. And with that, there's likelihood of bleeding, particularly in bacterial endocarditis, in people with bleeding dyscrasias. And anyone with active bleeding should not even take this medication in the first place. In angiodysplasia, dysplasia, and even anyone with severe abstention that is not under control, when there is history of antiplatelet inhibitors being used, we should not be using this medication at the same time. In anyone that complete blood count is revealing thrombocytopenia, then we take this medication off the table. In renal impairment, like I've just alluded to, once the kidney clearance is less than 30 mL per minute, please be careful there will be massive bleeding. In people that are not so big, and I don't mean to offend anyone. Anyone less than 50 kilogram should not use this medication under you know, certain situations. I'll go into details in a bit. The half-life of this medication is 17 hours. I've decided to put this there so that we will know that once we have administered this medication, we will not get out of it on time. Thrombocytopenia with thrombosis, similar to heparin induced thrombocytopenia, is possible here. So we have to deceive on the parinos if this means discontinue from the parinos if platelet is less than 100,000 per cubic meat. Still on warnings, in liver failure, we must exercise caution. In renal impairment, we should know that that may lead to prolonged anticoagulation, meaning there may be bleeding. In anyone that is older than 75, the tendency to bleed is likely going to be on increase. Still on warnings, the other time I said I will address the issue of less than 50 kg the more. Okay, we are now there. Here, in people less than 50 kg, the rate of clearance will be dropped by 30%, meaning more of the phenoparinos will remain in the system. We don't use phenoparinos as a prophylactic agent in people less than 50 kg. It is not advisable. Anyone going for major abdominal and orthopedic surgery and less than 50 kg should not use from the parents. Also, we have to be very careful if people less than 50 kg have DVT or pulmonary embolism, in short, venous thromboembolism. Still on warnings, two to four days after DC, meaning after discontinuation of fondaparinos, the effects of this very medication can still be felt. Remember, I've stated that the half-life is about 17 hours. Now, in epidural or spinal anesthesia, that is neuroasia anesthesia, we should expect spinal or epidural hematomas 
paralysis that may remain permanent, and the situation will be worse with anyone that is on non steroid anti inflammatory drugs concomitantly. In percutaneous intervention, no fundaparinos during primary percutaneous intervention. And it is not going to be used as the sole anticoagulant during PCR. You can add unfractionated heparin during PCR. Adverse reactions, bleeding. Please take note of this variable. Bleeding, bleeding, bleeding. Can occur at any site, in anyone on from the parents. More in people with liver or kidney disease. Remember, I said in kidney disease with kidney clearance less than 30 mils per minute, you should not even use it. In individuals that are less than 50 kg or older than 75 years, the tendency to bleed will be on the increase and it's worse when there is associated bleeding dyscrasia. Still on adverse reactions, there may be hypotension. Of course, when there's bleeding, either internal bleeding that is concealed or you know, hematoma that is large and so on, anemia for the same reason, thrombocytopenia and hematoma. There may be confusion. That's why central nervous system examination is necessary when we are trying to monitor individuals that are on this medication. Because there may be bleeding into the brain, right? And of course, anemia. Decreased potassium, that is hypokalemia, will likely occur here. So having electrolyte assay is not out of place. There may be insomnia. Epistasis, of course, part of signs of bleeding, right? And increased wound infections. Kidney is pretty important here. And why that? I have mentioned this you now at least about four or five times now, meaning this is very, very important. At kidney clearances and 13 meals per minute, please don't use for the parents. But if kidney clearance is between 30 to 15 mil per minute, it is better to use a low molecular weight heparin, or at least if you don't have any other option of using another heparin, then you have to decrease the dose of fundaparinos to half. In hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis, avoid the use of subcutaneous fundaparinos. Examples of where and when we can use fundaparinos will include in ST elevated myocardial infarction, we can give fundaparinos intravenously at 2.5 mg start on day one. After that, we can only give it subcutaneously from day two, still at the same dosage of 2.5 mg, but to be given only once daily until will be able to have percutaneous intervention done. But in non ST elevated myocardial infarction, please, no intravenous from the parinos. You may choose subcutaneous from the parinos at 2.5 mg once daily until PCI could be done. In the treatment of venous thromboembolism, that is DVT and pulmonary embolism, we can give on a parinos subcutaneously in people less than 50 kg, just 5 mg once daily. In people 50 to 100 kg, we can give 7.5 mg once daily. In individuals with kg, I mean that is weighing more than 100 kg, we can give 10 mg once daily. And we can give that for three months. If we are dealing with unprovoked prosima or isolated distal DVT with periodic monitoring, we can give it for three months if it is a provoked venous thromboembolism. But you may go beyond that if the provoking risk factor is or are still present. In venous thromboembolism prophylaxis. 
um, we will not give this in anyone less than 50 kg. Remember, I said that earlier, but we can give subcutaneous 2.5 mg once daily for medical patients with high rates of venous thromboembolism, eight hours post major surgery for cancer, we can give that, eight hours post or for non-cancer patient, we can give that, uh, unknown time of prophylaxis or for about 10 to 35 days or more if it is orthopedic surgery and not ambulatory or there are risk factors for venous thromboembolism that are still persistent. But you may choose 10 to 14 days mostly and you may change to power anticoagulants after. With that, I've come to the end of this very presentation. Phonoparinos is pretty helpful. If you are confused in any shape or form, please kindly contact your pharmacist, your other colleagues, or clinical pharmacologist. Because why trying to help these you know, fellow human beings, we should not add to their problems. Thanks for listening. Remember to subscribe. Remember to share all my presentations. I appreciate it.